Hello and welcome to See You in Court, the podcast that informs you about the Georgia civil justice system, what it means to you, and how it protects individual rights. This podcast is a collaboration between the Georgia Civil Justice Foundation and the Georgia Institute of Technology. Your hosts are Robin Fraser clark and Lester Tate, who are both past presidents of the State Bar of Georgia and currently serve on the board of directors of the Georgia Civil Justice Foundation. And now this episode of See You in Court. Good morning, friends and lovers of the law, and welcome to See You in Court. I am Robin Fraser Clark, and with us here today is our wonderful co host, Lester Tate. Hey, Lester, how are you this morning? I'm great. Good morning and Merry Christmas, because and, yeah. I think this is going to be our uh, uh, our last show of the year. So we're looking at Christmas and then off to a new year. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to honor our guests by not singing any Christmas carols because they don't want to hear me sing. Uh, well, I would like I would like to hear that. But <laughs> no, um, you wouldn't trust me. <laughs> but yeah, we wish every all of our listeners a Merry Christmas and this episode, we're going to do one of our um, episodes where we have all of the definitions of justice that our guests have given us put together. And uh, it's always an exciting episode to, to listen to that again and see how people define justice or what, what it means to them. You know, one of the things I love about that, and, and by the way, I need to make sure I give you full credit for being the one that came up with that uh, sort of trademark question of our our podcast. But one of the things I love about that is we actually tell our guests that we're going to ask you this beforehand. So it's not it's not an extemporaneous answer necessarily, but still almost every time we ask a guess that they sort of have to stop and think before they answer it. And, um, you know, if we don't do anything else, uh, on this podcast, I think making people be thoughtful about justice is, uh, is, is at least one check mark in our favor. Yeah, that's a great point. And, um, We've had some incredible guests on the podcast, and so when these folks um, talk about justice, it can be very moving. You know, I remember Craig Jones, for example, trial lawyer. Um, you know, he was moved to tears talking about it. It's just just an amazing concept, and and thank goodness we we live in a country that honors that. We and we fight for the rule of law. Um, that's something to keep in mind with everything that's going on. Uh, yeah. We've got to fight for the rule of law. Yeah. And there are probably a lot of cynics out there, you know, and, you know, your co-host is here's probably a cynic. But uh, there are a lot of cynics out there that say, well, our court system isn't about justice. But justice still is the ideal of our court system. Now, whatever your whatever field of endeavor you're in, ideal uh, is rarely realized or seen. But um and I don't know that we always accomplish it. I mean, in fact, I'm sure we fall short many times, but the fact that we have and continue to maintain that as an ideal, I think, uh, speaks about our values as as a people and as a country. For sure. Uh, definitely agree with that. So we wanted to start the episode with uh, kind of in reverse than what we usually do, and that's where Lester and I will talk about a couple of items in the news, law related that caught our attention. And I'll go first because I know what Lester's going to talk about and he deserves the floor on that one. So <laughs> mine's just a small snippet. Um, and the headline is judge removed for brandishing gun. He kept attached under bench with magnet. So just get that picture in your mind and a New York judge. Um, and, and he's a, uh, called a town and village justice. So that sounds a lot like our probate judges um, or or maybe magistrate judges who don't. Is it magistrate judges don't have to be a lawyer or, or probate judges don't have to be a don't lawyer. have to be. Uh, OK, probate judges some... don't have to be a lawyer. The other the other interesting thing of trivia, uh, Georgia trivia, prior to the 1983 Constitution, 
Do you know what probate judges were called? And they, they do a lot. This is no disrespect. They do a lot of very important work. Yeah. But they were called ordinaries <laughs> because they were judges of the ordinary court. And then you had the superior court. You had judges of the superior court. So they were they were actually called ordinaries. Well, so this judge in New York was not a lawyer. So we have some judges in Georgia, the same situation, not lawyers. But he um, brandished a gun against a litigant who was a uh, large man, African-American, and he pulled his gun, grabbed his gun from under his desk that was on a magnet and and pointed it at a litigant in his courtroom, uh, which is unbelievable to me. But, Lester, do you remember we had a Georgia judge do that? I, I do remember. Not, uh, too, was, not too long ago. I was actually uh, on the Judicial Qualifications Commission and. <laughs> that event took place i knew you would remember that i i was i was shaking my head when that happened and now it's happened again in new york and there's a racist tone to this because the the judge um tried to uh justify brandishing a gun against a litigant in his courtroom by saying he was a large black man six feet nine inches tall and built like a football player as if that were some sort of justification i mean it just makes me livid um, but the New York Court of Appeals, which is their highest court, uh, just took away his 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 um, seat on the bench, removed him from being a judge. And the court said this by repeatedly referring to the litigant in the manner that he did petitioner. That's the judge exploited a classic and common racist trope that black men are inherently threatening or dangerous, exhibiting bias or at least implicit bias, the appeals court said. And they said, while residing over his courtroom, the petitioner brandished a loaded firearm at a litigant who presented no threat to anyone. Rather than show remorse, he described his conduct in a press interview and boasted about it to his colleagues, while repeatedly and gratuitously referring to the litigant's race. So that person in New York is no longer on the bench. And I would say that seems about right to me. I think the the New York Court of Appeals got that one right. Also raises a sort of larger, interesting question that uh, I've I've thought about over the years. But, you know, some courthouse, Cobb County, for example, if you're not a Cobb County sheriff's deputy, you can't carry a firearm in in the courthouse. And, and and that's because they're the people charged with actually protecting. So if you're there as a witness or you're there you know, to, 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 you know, assist with the prosecution of a case. And they actually have lock boxes out front. And interestingly, yeah. I've actually availed myself of this uh, privilege before. If you're a member of the Cobb County Bar and you want to put your firearm in there, you can leave your firearm, uh, you know, in there. But, you know, if you think about it, if you're a criminal defense lawyer and you're cross-examining a guy and he's got a gun and you don't, <laughs> Uh, it's uh, it could be a little a little unsettling. So I like that policy, you know, of what, yeah. what the county does. Well, you know, we've had that terrible tragedy, and it's been a long time now. I don't remember what year when Brian Nichols shot a judge in Fulton Roland County Barnes. and a court in a Judge Barnes and a court reporter deputy. Um, and there's a beautiful memorial in Fulton County State Court now, or Superior, it's Fulton County Courthouse uh, to those victims. Um, but after that, a lot of judges started carrying guns on the bench. And I, you know, I don't blame them. I totally get that. Um, it 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 was an event that never should have happened. I can see wanting to protect myself. But you got to have some self-control and not just pull it oh, out. Yeah. Uh, well, well, you know, we had a lawyer here, uh, Tony Mari here in uh, yes. Arto County, Cartersville. Uh, yeah. We totally redid our security system, you know, as a result of that. Interesting. Uh, he uh, uh, was shot by uh, a pro se uh, defendant in a divorce uh, case. And so, you know, in a, uh, it's 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 fairly well, it's 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 having a gun in a country law office is, you know, sort of standard, really. Yeah. Now. Uh, and I, I'm sorry, society has gotten sort of that point. You know, you're not uh, no under no illusions that any lawyer I know or myself is wide or, you know, but 
uh, by the same token, you know, you might be able to defend yes. on your staff or, or, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. But uh, really sort of uh, uh, a concern that most people practicing law, being judges, participating in the legal process would not want to have to deal with. No. And I know your office is in Cartersville, Georgia. You're on the square, very traditional yep. Um, brick and mortar buildings, beautiful. Um, I'm in a high rise, you know, I'm on the 23rd floor of a high rise where you can't even get in the elevator unless the security guard lets you in the elevator. So as a, I'm a sole practitioner woman, I, that makes me feel a little more comfortable knowing no one's even can get into my floor without a security guard. So that helps. Yeah. I mean, you know, you, you, uh, you're, if you're a Main Street lawyer, uh, you, you have to have a door on the Main Street, and you don't have uh, security there to uh, say what's your business. You know, when where, where you go in when folks when folks come in, it's uh, it's just a little bit different, a uh, little bit different situation from what you face if uh, if you practice in Atlanta in a high rise, right. Well, I think they got it right. So what do, what do you have for us, Lester? So I'm going to go on my you, – you mentioned uh, – you did use the word football in your presentation. So my news article today comes from uh, The Athletic, which is a great uh, sports – a great spe uh, piece of sports journalism that I subscribe to. And uh, the headline uh, – uh, dated December 6, 2023, <clears throat> says Florida Governor Ron DeSantis to ask for $1 million for Florida State to sue <clears throat> college football playoff committee over snub. And so I think probably most of our listeners now know that undefeated ACC champion uh, Florida State was left out of the top four uh, teams to compete with the national championship. Uh, and uh, the Florida State fans are livid about it. Uh, many of us, <clears throat> like myself, being a Georgia Tech fan, uh, who are in the ACC are sort of upset about it. And so now Ron DeSantis uh, uh, says that he's going to put a million dollars for expenses to sue the playoff committee. So first thing I want to say is I think that suit's probably not going to go anywhere, <clears throat> you know. Uh, there are certainly areas such as name and image and likeness that the courts have sort of shaped college football. I doubt this suit goes any place, but I think it's uh, perfect for me to uh, uh, hoist myself onto my soapbox today as we talk about what is justice, because Florida State was the only team that got left out of the college playoffs that did every single thing that they could to make the playoffs. Uh, they didn't lose a game. They won a conference championship. Uh, others that went in, like Texas and Alabama, um, had lost games. You know, didn't happen with uh, with Florida State. Uh, you, you hear people say, oh, well, this is supposed to be the best four teams out there. Georgia Tech graduate that I am, if you're putting the best four teams out there, you still got to put the University of Georgia in that top four. So I think it was sort of a great uh, travesty uh, that that took place. Uh, the, uh, the other thing that I found that article interesting about, uh, you know, and I think, I think the first thing is when you talk about oh, we're going to go sue you. It's usually because you feel like you've been wrong some way. Now, because you've been wrong doesn't mean you get a remedy in court. But, you know, here's a real sort of expression of, you know, there's a whole uh, fan base there, you know, that sort of feels like that they, uh, that they have been wrong. The other thing that's interesting to me is that this committee has 13 members on it. And, you know, juries have 12 uh, usually you have an alternate in there as well. I suspect they have an odd number because, you know, they want uh, want somebody that can break ties, you know, or whatever else. But the interesting thing to me is having tried score of jury trials and uh, several this year, you get the instruction all the time to the jurors. Don't go read news articles about this. 
don't be texting with your friends or family about this. The decision is yours to make. And so one of the things I think would be really interesting is if they had this lawsuit and they were able to discover, uh, you know, get through the discovery process, all the text messages, the emails that are rolling in from ESPN and from their friends, the athletic directors, about you should pick this, no, they, because you know this debate was sort of raging out there. <laughs> and so I think it's a very novel, if ultimately unsuccessful idea. Uh, and I think it also, again, just sort of uh, symbolizes uh, what I think about as sort of an injustice, which is when you have a person or persons that have done everything that they could uh, within some framework or rubric and they still get still get slighted. It's not their fault. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's my that's my soapbox uh, preaching uh, for today, Robin. I like it. I wonder if Governor DeSantis has uh, hired a lawyer yet, because the, my, my first reaction is, OK, Governor DeSantis, when you feel wrong, who do you turn to? A trial lawyer. Thank exactly you. Exactly right. Hey, That's we could we could split up the million, Robin. I'd take the suit. You know, they want to pay us to do it. I would take that suit. You know, it'd be fun. I hope I hope whoever he hired, if he's hired somebody, has sent a preservation of evidence letter to, to all those <laughs> folks about their text too. messages. And, you, and you know, look, we wouldn't have any trouble getting expert witnesses. You know, we've had really a lot of the comments at Booger McFarlane and uh, uh, Paul uh, Feinbaum. Murray, you know, they have all, you know, sort of uh, uh, weighed in. So uh, we, we'd have our expert witness and um, we'd get a good fee out of it. And uh, it'd be, be, be a lot of fun, I'm sure. The, the other story about injustice in the college football playoffs is Michigan. And some people say Michigan shouldn't even be in there because of what their team did this year of stealing signals and signs. And yet they're playing for the college football playoff. And pa Paul Feinbaum on the SEC Network says, I will never recognize them. Even if they win everything, I'm never going to recognize them as national champions. Well, you know, they're, they're at best, they're, in my view, they're sort of headed for an asterisk. Asterisk, you know? yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, and and I've actually represented players that you know had some issue with the with the NCAA. And here here's the problem. You know, the NCAA is is the poster child for why people hate lawyers. <laughs> I mean, you know, they take forever. And um, and you know, so like they're putting Michigan in the playoffs, and they're going to have this investigation. So they'll have lawyers and investigators crawling over this thing for about two years. And, you know, Georgia's going to the Orange Bowl this year. Georgia Tech went to the Orange Bowl, I think it was in 2014. And then the NCAA later stripped uh, Georgia Tech of its runner-up status then, uh, as ACC champion because uh, Demarius Thomas, who was passed away now, horrible, uh, premature death. But uh, Demarius Thomas took a $300 jacket from – uh, from a sports agent, which now, you know, in the age of name, image, and likeness would be nothing. Right. But they, they want to come after the fact. And so, again, there's this trend sort of having things decided off the field instead of on the field. And, you know, if you've got the guy, wasn't he on the central Michigan sideline with <laughs> glasses recording the signals on the other side, which was clearly against the rule, that's the case. Why don't you count them now, you know? Yeah. But Jim Jim Harbaugh, the coach, says he's pulling the Trump defense of I don't know who that guy is. I've never met him in my life. <laughs> who, who who is he? It's all <laughs> it's all it's all fake news. Yeah, it's all fake news. Well, that's a good one, Lester, and uh, good luck to the teams in the college football playoff. Although our team Georgia is not going to be in it, and Georgia Tech's not going to be in it, but um, it, they had great years. No, but the 22nd of December is going to be a great day because I have uh, we have our office Christmas party uh, here at my house at noon. I couldn't go to the Tech Bowl game because I'm having the office Christmas party here at my house, but they play at 630. So I get to celebrate uh, my top-notch uh, staff who's like a family uh, to me and uh, watch Georgia Tech play in its first bowl game in a while. So Yeah, and I'm I'm betting there might be a, a bourbon in, in connected to that. I, I, out I, in front I of the fire. There, I think there I think there will be uh be, be a little bourbon consumed. Um 
you know, some of the folks in my office like wine or whatever better than that. I'm uh, in my old age, I'm almost a pure bourbon guy. You know, I rarely drink <laughs> beer or wine, but, you know, it's what I like. So, all right. And as in the Georgia Tech fight song, like all the jolly good fellows, I drink my whiskey clear. I'm a rambling wreck from Georgia Tech and a hell of an engineer. So, awesome. Well, listeners, uh, we hope you enjoy this episode of our guests telling us their definition of justice, what they believe justice is. And until next time, I mean, we're we are this is our last episode of the year. We'll see you back in January. We wish you a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year's. Um, and until next time, Lester, we'll see, we'll you, see in you in court. Michael Neff. I don't have a pithy expression of what justice is, but. I think it happens when people draw a line in the sand and say, uh, what happened is not okay. And I'm going to stand up and say something about that last story for today. But, um, Mm -hmm. you mentioned the cross examination of six flags as CEO. Well, um, I got to watch that from council table because Andy handled it. And there was a female juror um, smiling at the CEO during her testimony. And it really freaked me out. I'm like, geez, I I don't understand. I thought we were doing really well. Why is this woman smiling at the CEO? And I got to find out after the, the verdict. So when the CEO came out, she faced the jury and flashed this big smile at the jury. And uh, this juror who wound up being the four person didn't appreciate that. And so she gave the fake smile back throughout the cross-examination. And of course I had no idea of that until the very end. So I was like sleepless the night before closing argument, wondering, you know, did we lose this person or do other people feel that way? And I think that's kind of indicative of decent people being confronted with evidence and saying, you know what, I'm not going to take this. This isn't right. And that is what makes our country special from a lot of other countries because people, everyday citizens don't have the power to stand up to big corporations and tell them that's unacceptable. We're not going to take that. So that's justice to me. Douglas Amar. The best definition of justice I know is is Dr. King gave a great one. And that is, is that justice is love correcting that which revolts against love. That always, it just shakes me. And it it really gets down to sort of this answer, this thing you were talking about, Lester, is that the idea of justice, I think a lot of people, even in, in Christians or folks of faith, look at the Old Testament and they think justice and mercy are two different things that they're separated somehow. And I'm no biblical scholar, but my little bit of reading says that, that, no, these things are integrally connected. You can't separate the idea of love from justice or mercy from justice. The idea that, that they go together, but what is the most just is to use a spiritual principle in redeeming a situation, a person, a society, a law with love that is by definition sacrificial, uh, non-judging, uh, and filled with grace. So, yeah, I'd like to think that what we're doing here every day is justice, and it is an act of grace, because it's, a, it's about accepting people, no matter what they've done. It's about seeing the best in them, maybe in their future. But it's also about really acknowledging and affirming the humanity of all of us together, not just by me being a good lawyer or by us helping somebody on their path, but it's by that engagement together that I believe we're fulfilling justice because we are expressing love and receiving love in the sense of which correcting something that that is wrong. I mean, justice is about correction, but the the method to get to justice is through a a spiritual principle, Dr. King would say, of love. Chris Joyner. I think one definition of justice could be the actions that do the greatest good while causing the least amount of harm. Uh, Because in every instance, every action is going to have ripples. And 
I, and I think you see a lot of people in this story who are trying to address an injustice in the death of Buddy Stevens, but in fact are creating further injustices. I mean, it was what happened to Clarence Henderson should never happen to an American. He should never have been put in the position he was in. It was an injustice, and it did not correct the injustice of Buddy Stevens' death. Um, I think those actions that we take that correct that balance is where we find real justice. Ann Barnes. Justice is, you know, first and foremost, fairness, equal justice under law. And it's not for just us. It's justice for all. I mean, equal justice for all the, the, the poor and the rich, you know, the old and the young. And it's an important value. It's not, a value to be dismissed is that the only thing that counts is law. Justice, you have to stand back and look at the law to see that it makes sense. Uh, Common sense has to come into it and uh, rationality and logic and uh, truth. Truth is an important aspect of justice, but many people confuse justice with a good result, the result that I want. You know, that's, that's not justice. I think fairness, impartiality, truth, all of those make up justice. And it's, it's something that, although it may be something looked at from different angles, seen, it's still the same diamond. Say, if you see the diamond from the top, it looks different from here and people, but it, it's a basic value of fairness, impartiality, and truth. All of those are elements. Peter Canellos. I think it's the pursuit of a fair result. And I think that uh, Justice Harlan would say that there are many paths, often agonizing paths, that can lead to that result of justice. But he believed that, like Martin Luther King, the presence of justice is what safeguards our our society. You know, he had been part of a commission that went down to New Orleans in 1877 when there was such a division over a gubernatorial election that civil war was almost about to start again. And one of the issues was having federal troops sitting there occupying New Orleans. And he came to believe out of that, that you couldn't keep troops in the South forever to enforce the Constitution. But that had to be the job of the courts, and it had to be the job of lawyers. And it, it's more than just judges. It's the entire society and their commitment to the ideals of the Constitution. So he would say that we're constantly pursuing a fair result, and it's not a perfect process. Dissent, as his own case shows, plays a significant role in this. And yet, if you, if you hold fast to those constitutional values, you're, you're on the right path. Ray Persons. In a word, it would be fairness. Fairness. And I know that's equally as vague as justice, but just equality, equitable. I don't know that I can put it any other way, but that, but for me, it's fairness. And the fair result might not always be what you think it is or ought to be. And in, in, in the jury system, uh, it's, you know, what the jury comes back with, I oftentimes disagree with, with it, but then that's that's our system. And so, as I tell them in closing, art, I accept it. I accept their decision. And for me, that's, that's justice in a jury trial. Uh, more broadly, it's fairness, trying to get to a fair result. We're trying to mediate a case. We're trying to settle a case, trying to get to a fair result. What's fair to both sides? And that's, that's, that can be very, very difficult, especially right. when you're not making the final decision. Jenny. Jensen. Justice to me is about protection, penalties, and punishment. Um, and what I mean by that is everybody in our country should be treated the same. And justice takes power and levels it out and protects the people who don't have the control. Um, and they can be compensated for their harms, and the people who do wrong can be penalized and incentivized to stop doing their wrongs. Um, it levels out prejudice. It provides protection. 
And then I end up with, it's a process. It's always in progress. It isn't perfect, but we're moving in a positive direction. So that's how I would define justice as something that levels out power to protect people and penalize people. And we're always moving in a direction we hope is positive to perfect that. Mary Ellen Jacobs, Nanette Hausman, and Steve Welsh. Since nothing will bring Corey back, our justice will be to see change put in place in order to prevent something similar from happening. So that's what I would say. If if my justice is making a positive change to help families, universities, injury prevention, it gives it gives um, a little bit more purpose to Corey's um, short life. Stephen Wolf and Cheryl Lagarde. Why the damages caps haven't been improved? Why hasn't Congress made legislative fixes? You know, why is why does summary judgment creep in the direction of the corporation, but rarely push back in the in the in the direction of the employee? It's it's one of I think one of the underlying causes of of, of all of this is that um, there is you know the the the, the fi- your financial status um, affects how you're treated by the law at every point where the law touches people, um, and I think if you could not if you decoupled those relationships, I think you would have something more approaching justice, at least for our clients. Douglas Amar and Rami el Justice is love correcting that which revolts against love. It's a, it's a beautiful quote. I think about it a lot because it's pretty heavy. And I'll stop there and let's see what Rami has to say as, as our non-lawyer on the call. <laughs> oh, um, I would say meeting the needs of, of those who've been harmed, if there is harm that has occurred, um, and equity and inclusion wherever, whatever that may look like in different contexts. Went big million. You know, big picture justice is getting what we deserve, but we put on the law hat, it becomes a harder thing to get to. Um, and that's where process becomes more important than the substantive outcome of seeing that someone gets what, what they deserve. Um, because we create these processes to deal with a very you know, fallen type world. And there's so many ways things can go wrong, intentionally and, and unintentionally. In the, in the first book, The Murder of Sarah Barton, is that you have this prosecutor convinced of you know, the rightness of his ways in seeking justice, you know, get, giving, making sure someone gets what they deserve, they start spending rules. But it, they bought into some narrative that there's a bigger picture of making sure the defendant gets what you know, he or she deserves and lose sight of, you know, this isn't a novel. Bill Nettles. Don't tell me what's fair, right? I mean, you know, it just really annoys me when anybody on the other side says this is fair, right? Because the problem with that is fairness is a matter of perspective, right? So I really ran that around in my head a couple of times. I just and then and then you got the whole notion that like what's fair today, and like what we think of, what they thought of was fair in the 60s, 70s, even 80s. We don't find that fair anymore. And so you've got this whole notion of that fair is is evolving, fortunately, right? So I believe fairness is the absence of injustice. That justice is what happens if you take out all injustice. Dennis Cathy. Justice is righteousness and the right thing. There's so many components to it. And, you know, in Deuteronomy, it said uh, justice tempered with mercy. I think mercy is a component of justice. I think it's in there. That's it. And that, and that is, I think, the mercy part of it. But justice is the right thing to do for all parties considering the circumstances. That's justice. And to me. And I think we all ought to strive for that. And, uh, and we do. I think we do. Now, uh, um, your idea of what's justice in a case is not often the same idea of the opponents. And uh, in the adversarial proceeding, that's going to happen. But what we must do is accept what we think due process gave us. And if we had our due process and if we had our 
day and we had our say and whatever results more overwhelmingly than not that's justice nails peterson justice is fairness i think justice is everybody being heard I think justice is treating people who are similarly situated in similar ways. And I think justice is making right things that have gone wrong. I think justice is all of those things. But in the justice system, different people have different responsibilities and different authority. Trial judges have an immense amount of authority to do justice the way they see it. They have an immense amount of discretion. That's incredibly important, and it really matters having great trial judges, and we have a ton of great trial judges in this state. The role of an appellate judge, though, is different. The role of an appellate judge is not to reach out and substitute my own judgment for what justice is in a case where all I see is a cold transcript. Mike Jacobs. Sometimes... The outcome of a case or a ruling goes your way, sometimes it doesn't. But justice ultimately is everyone leaving that courtroom feeling that they were heard, feeling that the judge understood what they were saying, and that that outcome, whatever it is, is the product of everyone being heard and the judge understanding both everything that was said or presented during the hearing but also faithfully applying the law. Martin Siegel. To have a just outcome, you need to take kind of everything into account. <laughs> Certainly, the obviously, the language and, and what the framers of a law or a constitutional provision meant. Um, but beyond that, you know, beyond that, what, what does it mean in society today? What are contemporary ideas of justice as it relates to really broad phrases like equal protection or, you know, privacy or something like that. Uh, um, what it, What's the latest, you know, writing on it in the academy? Like he, he, all of those things. What, what are the judge's own sort of moral or ethical impulses one way or the other? Um, he, he didn't think you could really reach justice without taking everything into account. And I, I tend to think that's true. Thank you for listening to See You in Court. Brought to you by the Georgia Civil Justice Foundation and the Georgia Institute of Technology. Please subscribe to this podcast and consider writing a review. You may find related documents to this week's episode on our website, cuincourt.podbean.com. Please send any questions, suggestions, or ideas to cuincourtpodcast at gmail.com.